Today, I want to get to my favorite topic of all, and that is the use of games in the math classroom and at home. Why would games belong in the math classroom? They belong front and center because they are a celebration of problem solving, and problem solving deserves to be at the core of your teaching experience of mathematics. The first game that might come to mind is a game like chess. Chess has got a rich history, but it's also complex to teach, and pieces can get lost. Go is a game with at least as rich a history, 4,000 years, and it is much simpler to teach. The pieces are all the same, so if you lose half a dozen of them, who cares? But it is a long game, so you should definitely also consider a modern pure strategy game. Let's look at those of Chris Berm. Chris Berm is the best pure strategy game designer ever. His games of Tsar and Devon are two of my favorites. Inversi seems custom built for the mathematics classroom. The pieces are big clunky things that are practically indestructible, and the game plays in five minutes. On top of that, all of the pieces have the same volume. That just seems like a game that you have to have around. Santorini is my own game, so here's a bias alert. But I also think that this game is perfect for the mathematics classroom. It's deeply strategic, and the games play quickly in about 10 to 15 minutes. And if you lose a few of the tiles, you're okay, because they're generic. We shouldn't constrain ourselves only to looking at pure strategy games. There's some marvelous games out there that blend luck and strategy. Quirkle, fantastic game for your grade one classroom. The pieces are practically indestructible, and if you lose a couple, it's okay. Blocus is a great game to recommend to parents. It's not suitable for the classroom, because if you lose a piece, it ruins the game. Ratatat Cat and For Sale are great games to get children into the feeling for the order of numbers. If you purchase Ratatat Cat, make sure you do not buy the deluxe version. Lost Cities, a game by the most prolific game designer in history, Reiner Knizia, PhD in mathematics, and Lost Cities, great way to introduce your students to multiplication. This one is only appropriate for the home environment just because it's going to be too expensive. It's only a two-player game, a jam of a two-player game, but that just gets too expensive for the average school. Stone Age is a great game to recommend to parents who have children that are learning division. The game is lavishly produced. Trivia games also have a place, and my favorite among them is Wits and Wagers Family. This is a great game to recommend to families that have at least four gaming players. Games that are non-competitive are appropriate for some families whose children don't want to compete against one another. Two of my favorites, Hanabi, a game uh, newly arrived in North America this year, and Pandemic. In both of those, you're all playing against the game. If you have a student who is addicted to violent computer games, you might try experimenting, after getting the child help, you might try experimenting with putting the violence in context. So a great way to do that is through the game Memoir 44. This is a two-player strategic game that uh, puts the student into uh, battles around the D-Day landings. This video would not be complete if I didn't introduce you to the single best game for the elementary school curriculum. I'm not going to tell you what it is yet. Instead, I'm going to tell you about how to bid during that game. So here is a bid of 35. That means that there are at least three fives. This is a bid of 42. That means that there are at least four twos. In this game, each time that you bid, you must outbid the previous bid. So 42 was higher than the previous bid. 43 is the next highest bid, so that means that there are at least four threes. So each turn you can either call bluff or you can increase the bid. 52 is a higher bid. There are at least five twos. The game is Perudo, or Liar's Dice. It's 500 years old. It was 
there is a recorded play between Atahualpa, the last free king of the Inca Empire, and Pizarro, the Spanish conquistador, whose actions eventually resulted in Atahualpa being strangled. Well, let's look at this happy game that was born in unhappy circumstances. I split the class into three groups whenever I'm introducing this, this game, so they each roll five dice. The dice are kept secret from the other groups. So the red group is going to start here. They make a bid. So for example, they might say that there are at least two sixes. Have they told the truth? They actually haven't told the truth, but they don't know that because they can't see the green and blue dice. And more importantly, the green group, which goes next, doesn't know that that is a bluff. So the green group says two sixes. That sounds reasonable. There's probably at least two sixes out there. They've got two fours, so they're going to say that there are at least three fours out there. Now the blue group doesn't have any fours, so they think 34. That's a pretty high bid. I'm going to call bluff on that. Now, in fact, there are three fours out there. So the blue group, unfortunately, was not truthful whenever they said bluff, so they're going to lose a dice. Now it begins again with the group after the group that lost the dice. So they roll again. Here we have uh, a really good roll by red. Look at that, 3-3. Three, three. So red is feeling very confident. They're going to say, okay, I think that there are at least four threes out there. 43. Green says 46. There are at least four sixes. Now, the blue group is going, hmm, I don't really want to call bluff on four sixes because I have one of them. So the blue group gets smart and they think, well, the red group started with a bit of 43. So I'm going to up that to 53. There are at least five threes. Now the red group is in a quandary. They certainly do not want to call a bluff on five threes because they have three of them. So what do they do? They increase the bid to six threes. And green, for green, that is just too much. So they call bluff. And who wins? Well, count the number of threes. You'll see that there's only five of them, not six of them. So in this case, it was a good time for green to call bluff and red loses a dice. You keep on going until you have one group that has dice and all of the other groups are out, or you can end whenever the first group is out of dice. Enjoy the game. It is truly a gem. Don't spend oodles of money buying quality versions. You can just go out and get beautiful dice and uh, save your money. That's one of the reasons that this is a gem, not only because it's got a 500 year history, not only because it's a highly engaging game, but also because it's cheap. Thank you.